Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Northshire Presents virtual event. Uh, my name is Davith Wood. I'm this events manager at Northshire's Manchester, Vermont location, and I'm here as so often with my good friend and colleague, Rachel Person from Northshire's Saratoga Springs location. Before we get started, just a few quick notes before we get to the good stuff, a, a book that's been blurbed by Mastakilla from uh, Wu-Tang. Um, we are recording this event, as you noted when we came in, So, um, oh, but only those of us who are uh, unmuted and speaking in this nice little yellow box will be appearing on, on YouTube for perpetuity. Um, so if you have any questions at any point or comments, please type them in the chat. Rachel and I will save those up and uh, ask them at the end. Um, and uh, finally, it's a note of thanks. Uh, new year and a new slate of events, and we're, we're, we're virtual again, sadly, um, completely virtual, at least for a little bit. But um, thank you all for joining us. And uh, Rachel, uh, get, get on to the good stuff. I am so very pleased this evening to get to welcome back Todd Snyder. He's an associate professor of English at Siena College and the author of books including 12 Rounds at Lowe's Gym, Boxing and Manhood in Appalachia, and Bundini, Don't Believe the Hype both massive Northshire staff favorites from our wonderful bookseller, Chris Linendahl. He's with us tonight to talk about his newest book, Beatboxing, How Hip Hop Changed the Fight Game. And he will be interviewed this evening by Lisa Witkowski, Siena's Director of Public and Government Affairs. Please join me in welcoming them both here this evening. Thank you. Our pleasure. Hello, everyone, and welcome on this cold winter's evening. We'll get started right away. Um, on the cover of Beatboxing, it describes the book as step into a world of rap moguls turned fight promoters, boxers turned rappers and rappers turned boxers. From Mike Tyson to Tupac, from Roy Jones Jr. to Jay Prince, explore how a cultural collision forever altered the relationship between music, race, sports, and politics. Todd, boxing and hip hop are two of your passions. Tell us how you became interested in them. Yeah, before I even answer that, I just want to thank Northshire for bringing me on again. Uh, you know, it's one of my favorite bookstores. They've always given me a platform to discuss my books, and they've always stocked my books on their shelves. So I just want to give love to Northshire, both branches. They, they've been wonderful to me in my career. But to answer your question, uh, this feels like the book uh, that I was born to write, Lisa, in so many ways, because it really does marry the two compass points uh, to my identity. You know, I love hip hop. I love boxing. They're really the outside of my family, the two things I love most. Uh, so this is a professional passion and a personal passion for me okay. uh, in exploring this research. Uh, on the family side of things, I grew up the son of a boxing trainer. So my father was a boxing trainer. I grew up around boxing gyms. My whole life was being around the sport of boxing. Okay. So you know, as a young person coming up, uh, you know, boxing was everything to me. So, you know, I really had no choice but to fall in love with the sweet science because it was in my family. Now, as far as hip hop goes, hip hop was my first love. So I grew up in the 80s and I kind of grew up with hip hop, even though I grew up in rural West Virginia. Uh, you know, we had hip hop down there, too. And, you know, we were falling in love with it, just like the rest of the country was. So really, you know, rap music to me was a gateway into poetry. It was a gateway into politics. It was a gateway into fashion and sports and art and so many conversations that were not happening in my neck of the woods. So, you know, I come up, you know, as a kid who wanted to be a writer, wanted to be, uh, you know, someone who, you know, was interested in language and wanted to be, you know, a part of that scene because of hip hop. You know, I go to a lot of book readings and, and folks will say, who are the authors that inspired you the most? Well, the truth is, you know, guys like Biggie and Tupac and, you know, uh, so many of those early hip hop icons that were a part of my era were the folks who got me into writing, who made me want to be a poet, made me want to be a writer. Uh, the boxing side was always there because of my family. So the way I watched the sport of boxing was through the lens of the intersection between the two cultures. So I was interested in relationships like Tupac and Mike Tyson, as you alluded to, and Floyd Mayweather and 50 Cent, Roy Jones and James Prince, who founded Rap A Lot Records. Uh, I was always sort of interested in boxing because there was so much hip hop in it. And it kind of married what my father loved and what I loved, and it was a bonding experience for us. And as you can imagine, they're not listening to Celine Dion and boxing gyms. Uh, no matter where you are around the country, it's hip hop and boxing gyms. 
So, you know, from training to just being around it, to being in the arena, I've always viewed the two cultures sort of a part of the same Venn diagram. They intersect in so many ways. So this book was really one I've, I've been researching and wanting to write since I was a kid. Can you explain further about that connection between boxing and hip hop? Maybe give some examples. Yeah, well, I mean, the easiest one uh, is today, if you watch a professional boxing match, you would be hard pressed to not see a fighter come to the ring without a rapper performing a little mini concert. That's sort of a huge staple in boxing today. Part of the showmanship of boxing is in a lot of the big pay-per-view fights, they don't just walk to the ring to rap music. They bring the rapper with them and often they perform a live little mini concert as they go to the ring. So like you can't really watch boxing without seeing rap and seeing rappers in the crowd and that kind of thing. One of the folks I interviewed for the book was Justin Hoffman, who's the DJ for Top Rank. Uh, that's the ESPN uh, boxing network. Uh, they have a live DJ scratching and playing hip hop music during fights. So, I mean, you know, it's really the sound. Now, the other way that you see the two worlds mingle is you see a lot of boxers get into the rap, in, you know, the rap game. Guys like Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson, Roy Jones, Zab Judah, all founded hip hop record companies. So these are world champion boxers who got into rap music and were sort of entrepreneurs in that world. You also see a lot of hip hop moguls like uh, James Prince, Dame Dash, who started out as rap moguls who are now fight promoters and boxing managers. So, you know, from the showmanship of the sport to the intersection between, uh, you know, entrepreneurship in both worlds, really it's, it's unavoidable if you follow the sport. And of course, uh, anyone who listens to rap music knows boxing shows up in hip hop music quite a bit. And we have a database in the back of the book that has 500 hip hop songs that have specific direct references to boxing history fighters, promoters, ring announcers, trainers, just to give us sort of a, a mini sort of sampling of how deep uh, hip hop's love for boxing really is. It shows up in all the major rap albums. Uh, from the very start of hip hop, we see Muhammad Ali references, references to Sugar Ray Leonard and other fighters. Mm -hmm. So really, if you're paying attention to the sport of boxing, you have to know a little bit about hip hop. If you're listening to hip hop, you have to know a little bit about boxing. Could you share some of your writing from the book with us? Sure, yeah. Um, here's the book. It's called Beatboxing, How Hip Hop Changed the Fight Game. And what I thought I would read for them tonight is just a brief little passage from the introduction to the book. Um, usually I don't, you know, with a book like this that has so much research in it, you want to keep yourself out of the narrative. But I feel like I did have to sort of justify why I wrote this book because it's so personal to me. Uh, a lot of folks know me from my Appalachian Studies work, so they, they see me that way. Some people know me from my hip hop scholarship, and other folks know me as a boxing writer. So I wanted to explain why a person like me would write a book like this. So the intro to the book is called uh, Tale of the Tape. And if you've ever watched uh, a boxing match, right before the fight starts, they put up a graphic called Tale of the Tape. And it, it's just the measurements of the two fighters, their height, their weight, their record, the, the reach, that kind of thing. Well, mine is tell the cassette tape because cassette tapes were such a huge part of my life coming up. So I wrote about the A side and the B side to my personality. The A side to me was hip hop. And that side was me taking these Maxwell 120 minute cassette, uh, cassette tapes and holding the little handheld recorder to the TV when Young TV Raps was on so I could record the music because where I lived, there was nowhere to buy it. And the other side of, of my personality, the B side, is me taking these VHS tapes and recording fights on the TV and watching them with my dad when he would get home from the gym. So I'm just gonna read the couple, first couple pages of the introduction. And this is the tale of the tape. So we'll start with the A side. I found it on the dusty screen of a hand-me-down television set. Flickering images casting late night shadows on the paneling of my bedroom walls. It found me on the passenger seat of my Aunt Michelle's two-door Ford Escort, windows down, curvy mountain roads leading nowhere. The message, Planet Rock, tougher than leather, the great adventures of Slick Rick, paid in full. 
yellow number two pencils, carefully rewinding 120 minute Maxwell cassette tapes, scenes from my trailer park childhood. I found it in the wrinkled pages of the source, hidden underneath hardback textbooks, foam covered earbuds, dollar store brand, transmitting the Eden story of a displaced people, a culture born of breakbeat poets, cross Bronx expressway, overcrowded project buildings, block parties, graph writers, b-boys, b-girls, DJs, crate diggers, masters of ceremony. The spirit traveled from the boogie down Bronx, 1520 Cedric Avenue, and made its way from one borough to the next, migrated west to California, showed itself in Miami, Houston, New Orleans, and Atlanta, all while snaking its way down in those twisting and turning back roads of the dirty South. I found it on two hour pilgrimages to Crossroads Mall, captured it on handheld cassette recorders, carefully positioned inches away from television speakers doing episodes of Yo! TV Raps. It found me tucked away in the Appalachian Mountains, Cowan, West Virginia to be exact. Ours is the story of coal camps, company script and absentee owners. We are the descendants of blood feuds and bearded hillbillies, they say. Backwoods yokels, rugged mountaineers, moonshine distilleries, outhouses, welfare queens, opioid epidemics, Eden stories of a different variety. Stereotypical notions of life in the mountains that shape and exaggerate our isolation. And yet the spirit of hip hop culture found us just the same. It was baggy Levi's jeans, crooked baseball caps and oversized flannel shirts. It was that hip spicy lingo, colorful urban vernacular mixed with a slow Southern drawl. It was an identity performance that more often than not received poor reviews. It was poor old Ray Brown peering out of the school bus window, elbows spilling over the metal railing, hollering, hey Todd, where did you get those Negro clothes? It was a series of parent-teacher conferences, well-meaning concerns mixed with a few racist comments. It was a long and often painful conversation at the supper table, both supportive and cautionary. It was a topic of debate among a rowdy group of snuff-dipping Botech boys lurking the hallways of Webster County High School. It wasn't easy. It was a foreign language, coded, rich with metaphor and double entendre. It was Malcolm X peering out of the window with an assault rifle. It was John Carlos and Tommy Smith and their defiant black fists. It was the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali. It was his sidekick and poet laureate, Drew Bundini Brown. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see. It was the nation of Islam. It was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It was Afros, it was braids, it was style, flavor. It was a different way of seeing and understanding the world. Conversations that wasn't nobody from my neck of the woods having. It was a window, it was an education. We are the children of coal miners and loggers, blue collar workers. We were born and raised in the sticks way up a holler. We are the generation of Appalachian kids raised on bluegrass fiddles and breakbeats, yonder mountain string band and Tupac Shakur. We are contradictions, walking juxtapositions. Appalachian rap didn't exist when we were youngins. There were no country rappers, no hip hop producers sampling bluegrass fiddles and washboard rhythms. Hip hop didn't belong to us and we were only spectators and yet we loved it just the same. We were the first wave of Appalachian kids who fell head over heels. It's just a fad, it'll die out. It's just a phase. Anyone who knew kids like us, anyone who was paying any measure of attention should have seen it coming. The spirit of hip hop culture turned us into scavengers of language, fashion, sports, art, and politics. Led us to those black and white composition notebooks 25 cents a piece down at the food land, and we rode our way out of the hollers. So that's the first part of the introduction of the book, Tell the Tape. And thank you, I appreciate it. The other okay. side of my personality is so much easier to explain because I grew up in boxing gym. So the, the B side talks about growing up around boxing and how that influenced my concept of masculinity as a young man. But you gotta get the book to check that part, I guess. <laughs> 
That's terrific, Todd. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, was boxing involved in or did it inspire the actual genesis of hip hop and rap or did those two fields connect later on? And I no. love your phrase about uh, when you were a young person coming up that you were scavengers of, of music, of fashion, of sport, of politics, how you were taking from the different fields to build your own persona. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, in day one of my hip hop class at Siena, I tell my students that hip hop wasn't born in a vacuum. It wasn't like one person invented it. I mean, we've had, you know, icons come to our campus like Grandmaster Flash, who would definitely be on the, the Mount Rushmore hip hop. But there was no one person, one, not one group of people who invented the idea of hip hop. It was Motown. It was funk. It was disco. It was the black exploitation films that were big at the time. It was the spoken word culture that was happening in the late 60s and 70s. I mean, there were so many factors, the Harlem Renaissance, the civil rights movement that played a part in creating what we know now as hip hop. But in saying that, the one athlete who is the most responsible for hip hop is Muhammad Ali. And his persona from the rhymes to the bravado rhetoric was the template for early MCs when hip hop becomes a thing a couple of decades later. And even before Muhammad Ali, we had the first black heavyweight champion whose name was Jack Johnson, who was very flamboyant. He wore a fur coats. He was very controversial for the time. He, he taunted his opponents uh, lyrically and with his fists. Uh, he married a white woman, which is very taboo during his day. So Jack Johnson and Muhammad Ali were sort of two athletes who very much created a persona that would be use this the rhetorical template for, for early MCs like LL Cool J and Rakim, uh, Big Daddy Kane, some of the folks I interviewed for the book. So there is no hip hop without Muhammad Ali, that's for sure. Let's, and you know we talk about that in the book as well. Let's explore that a little more, how his persona and identity can serve as a model for some hip hop artists. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you gotta think with champions like Joe Lewis or athletes like Jackie Robinson, these were guys who were very polite by the standards of the day. They very much tried to be humble, uh, grateful for the opportunities they were getting in a world where a lot of black athletes didn't get those opportunities. Ali was something brand new. He made up uh, poems about his opponents and taunted them like he was a professional wrestler. He said, I'm you know, not just great, I'm the greatest who's ever lived. He bragged about how handsome he was. It, it was his swagger, his persona, his... Uh, you know, his bravado that was something brand new. And of course, you know, Ali goes on probably to become the most famous boxer who's ever lived, partially because of that persona, that personality. Uh, you know, I wrote a book, as Rachel alluded to earlier, about his cornerman, Drew Bundini Brown, who was, in fact, the poet laureate of the corner, the guy who wrote those rhymes. And he and Bundini would do these routines before a fight where they would make up little poems about the opponent, give them nicknames, uh, sort of give a, a prediction for what round they were going to knock the guy out in before the fight happened. Uh, a lot of the early hip hop icons who come out in the early 80s were watching those fights and their families were watching those fights. And that became this new black masculinity that became the template for how these rappers talked. You know, from day one, rappers are saying, I'm not great. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest MC who's ever lived. And like they were very much doing the Ali stick, the Bundini stick when rap first became a thing. Uh, and of course, Ali's social justice stances, what he represented outside the ring was maybe even more impactful for, for hip hop. Hip hop did begin through organizations like the Universal Zulu Nation as community organization groups uh, that get people out of gangs and off negative things and sort of give them something positive so they could be proud of who they are as people. So I think hip hop, borrowed from Ali in that sense as well, who he was as a humanitarian, as an activist. Okay. Um, another fighter, September 7th, 1996 was the night of the Mike Tyson versus Bruce Selden fight at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. That was also the night that rapper Tupac Shakur was killed. Tupac right. and Tyson had a strong connection. Let's discuss that. Yeah, I mean, uh, a night I'll never forget as a boxing fan. And I interviewed a lot of people who were a part of that night for the mm -hmm. book. Um, 
you know, I, as a young kid, you got to remember, I'm the kid in, from the introduction to that book who loved boxing because of my father and loved hip hop because it spoke to me in, in, in some kind of spiritual way. That night was so exciting because there's Mike Tyson looking to unify the heavyweight championships and who's by his side, Tupac, who's the most famous rapper in the world. Like Tyson, Tupac was bigger than hip hop. Mm -hmm. And these guys were best friends and they were hanging out together. And Tupac was very much a part of the fight that night. He wrote an original rap song for Tyson for him to walk to the ring to. It was like a diss track of Bruce Selden, who you mentioned. And that was a, a first in boxing history. There were a lot of guys who walked to the ring to rap music, but never had anyone walked to the ring to an original song made for them for the fight. Well, as you can imagine, after that night, every boxer is trying to find a rapper to do that for him, you know, as, as history goes on. The sad part is that, of course, Tupac Shakur is, is gunned down in the MGM, you know, after he leaves the MGM Grand that night, and he dies seven days later in the Las Vegas hospital. And I refer to it in the book as the Big Bang moment. Because hip hop had a sort of street level connection with boxing. A lot of boxing gyms are in tough neighborhoods. A lot of rappers come from the same streets as those champion boxers. Uh, but really after Tupac and Tyson and after that night in Vegas, it, the, the two cultures become forever linked because that, that night is not a hip hop story, nor is it just a boxing story, it's both. And uh, it's a night that will forever, it, it forever changed the course of history in rap and in boxing. And it was very exciting to interview some of the fighters who fought on the undercard. And they were all very excited that Tupac was there that night. And, you know, I talked to Christy Martin who fought on the undercard and she said, you know, her, one of her uh, sparring partners went up and got a picture with Tupac, you know, before the fight. And he would be, you know, he would be gunned down just hours later. Wow. And it gave her an eerie feeling to think she was there with him and he was healthy and happy. And then a couple of hours later, he's, he, he's in bad shape. Oh, okay. Thank you for sharing that with us. Could you share some more of your book? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the second part I wanted to read tonight is actually about Tupac and Tyson. So that's a good segue. It's from a chapter uh, called Me Against the World. And if you know anything about Tupac Shakur's career, um, his third album was titled Me Against the World. So all the titles in my book for the chapters are, are based off hip hop songs or hip hop albums that speak to the time period I'm talking about. And uh, what I'm doing in this uh, segment of the book is just trying to wrap my head around how significant both guys were to their cultures mm -hmm. and the ways in which both of them are sort of like um, I I icons in other fields who are sort of bigger than their own uh, persona. They're sort of their mythologies are bigger than their accomplishments. And, you know, their accomplishments were great. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple pages from the chapter. It's chapter six in my book called Me Against the World. And this is about Tupac Shakur and Mike Tyson. So I'm gonna begin with Tupac. Tattooed on his neck, a nod to the Italian philosopher, Niccolo Machiavelli, whose 16th century political treatise outlined the amoral nature of those who rise to power. Tattooed on the right side of his chest, an image of Nefertiti, an Egyptian queen, the left side of his chest bore the hip hop spelling of his namesake, an Indian warrior who, against all odds, led his tribe's final revolt against the Spanish Inquisition. Alongside his upper abdomen, an image of an AK-47 assault rifle. Scrawled along his midriff, the most famous and iconic tattoo, Thug Life, the letter I replaced by a bullet. On his right shoulder, the chilling image of a masked goon, a wad of cash in his hand, tethered to the scales of justice, an infant baby resting on one scale and a stack of gold bars on the other. Tattooed along his left bicep, the image of a skull and crossbones inscribed with the word heartless. Tattooed diagonally down his left forearm in old English font, the word notorious. On the inside of his forearm, a seven point crown inscribed with the phrase, trust nobody. On his left shoulder, the image of a vicious Black Panther, symbolic of his family ties to the revolutionary socialist political organization. Tattooed slightly below the Panther, 
a description, a depiction of Jesus Christ, a crown of thorns upon his head, dying on a burning cross. The inscription reads, only God can judge me. Framed by a tribal design, diagonally on his right forearm, the word outlaw. A large Gothic cross covered much of his back. Inside the cross, Exodus 1831, a reference to Nat Turner's 1831 slave revolt. Along his shoulders, in cursive handwriting, fuck the world. On each side of the cross, tattooed images of sock and busking, ancient Greek symbols of comedy and tragedy. Appropriately listed below each figure, the words smile now and cry later. Like the tattooed symbols that covered his body, Tupac Amaru Shakur was an enigma, a contradiction. Tupac was not hip hop's first superstar. He was the genre's first crossover success. Rather, Tupac may have been hip hop's first legend. He was a larger than life cultural icon who like figures such as Bob Marley and James Dean lived fast and died young. The story of Tupac's enduring legend is for better or for worse, unavoidably intertwined with that of the late 20th century's most famous prize fighter, Mike Tyson. With the two men, their lives and careers paralleled. Both were abandoned by their fathers, born in the systemic poverty, escaping those daunting circumstances, while also falling victim to the so-called trappings of fame and success. Each man was, at times, his own worst enemy. First came Tyson, the youngest heavyweight champion in the history of the sport. It wasn't who Tyson defeated in the ring, but how he defeated them. Even for the most violent of sports, Tyson's fire and ferocity was something new. Never had a heavyweight champion obliterated his opponents with such menace. Even after watching Tyson crawl along the canvas on his hands and knees, fumbling for his mouthpiece, it was impossible to imagine him as anything other than the baddest man on the planet. Then came Tupac Shakur, a rapper whose cultural and political significance far exceeded the influence of any of his predecessors. He wasn't hip hop's greatest lyricist, the king of punchlines or metaphors. He didn't have the quickest flow or even the highest record sales. His influence extended beyond the record business. Tupac albums felt bigger than music. Their significance attracted the attention of politicians, pundits and presidents alike. The five bullets he had taken in the lobby of Quad Studios would only make his music that much greater we imagine. In one sense, Mike Tyson is Tupac in shorts, in boxing shorts, and Tupac is Mike Tyson with a microphone, renowned scholar Michael Eric Dyson suggested. Dyson's comparison is appropriate. In both instances, the rise to power was meteoric. The anger frightened us. The unpredictability kept us watching. The talent captured our imagination. Each man was bound by the cavernous depths of his myth-making. Mythologies that far exceeded the boundaries of their real life accomplishments, which were indeed spectacular. Each man, not unlike the tattoos etched on his skin, lived as a symbol. So that's the beginning of chapter six, me against the world. <laughs> Thanks guys. Todd, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I was struck by what you said about how each man became larger than the field he was in and represented not just boxing or hip hop, mm -hmm. but American culture, American struggle, and spoke for so many different people in so many walks of life. You have, I would think, a lot of material to cover here, um, to explore, to tie it together. Uh, who did you interview for beatboxing and how did you organize those interviews? Well, that was the tricky part, uh, Lisa, is, is getting these interviews. The only thing that was working in my favor, and I hate to even say this, was that I was asking for interviews during the pandemic. And the bulk of these interviews were conducted during the period in which we were all pretty much locked down. Okay. So a lot of the rappers and boxers I talked to were just doing everyday normal things. Uh, you know, I would interview a world champion boxer and he was, you know, cutting his grass or, you know, he was, you know, making dinner or, you know, I would interview some rapper and he would say, hey, 
you know, I don't have anything else to do but be in the studio and work on my music. So it was a little easier to get these interviews. So our goal was to, to get 25 world champions who were at the height of their career during the 80s and 90s when this connection was really starting to form. And we talked to legends of the game like James Tony, uh, James Lights Out Tony, Bernard Hopkins, a lot of the guys who I grew up idolizing as a kid. And of course, icons of hip hop like Eric B, Big Daddy Kane. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Wu Tang Clan earlier. I talked to most of the guys in the Wu Tang Clan, Inspector oh, Deck, Master Killer, uh, those guys, uh, Mathematics, who drew the Wu Tang logo, their DJ. Okay. So I interviewed uh, a, a bunch of hip hop icons and a bunch of uh, boxing folks as well. And I would talk about, you know, hip hop with the boxing guys and vice versa. And what was great is that these guys were folks just like me who grew up loving both. You know, I knew pretty early on that most of the guys I was going to interview were folks who loved boxing. You know, I'd seen many of them perform those mini rap concerts at fights that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. One of the guys who was on a newer rapper I interviewed was a guy named D Smoke, who uh, performed uh, entry music for Deontay Wilder, who was the heavyweight champion at the time, back in 2020, right before the shutdown. And they did sort of a Black History Month tribute in his ring walk. And I was able to interview him about how that came to be, all the behind the scenes stuff, you know, what it's like to sort of be a part of the, you know, big heavyweight championship fight like that. So it, it, it was tricky getting the interviews, but once you made a good connection, it was a snowball effect. You know, uh, some of these guys we brought to campus for our Siena Hip Hop Week, and they kind of knew me and trusted me a little bit, and they would help me get connections with other rappers. Uh, I'm a little more connected in the boxing world. So, you know, you know, good connections begat other good connections. So that was the big hustle of this book is I knew most of the history just because I'm a fan. Uh, but I needed those personal stories that were behind the scenes, you know, the stories that no one had ever heard before. So that was, you know, truly one of the blessings, you know, doing this work is this was my pandemic book this is what kept me sane during the, you know, the worst part of the pandemic is that I was able to talk to all these iconic rappers and boxers about our love for the both cultures. And um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I'll never forget this book. It's like, you know, you're not allowed to pick one favorite kid. You know, you're supposed to love all your children the same. This is like my favorite kid, even if I don't know if it's my best book, but it's my favorite just because uh, I was able to meet and work with so many people I admired growing up. It was truly a blessing. When you started your interviews, did you go in with a thesis or a framework of something you wanted to pursue, or mm -hmm. did you organize the interviews afterward and, and, and come up with, the, with that? Yeah, anytime I knew I had an interview coming up, that's when grad school paid off. I would go into serious research mode. I would watch every fight a guy had, or I would watch, I would listen to every track, trying to comb that and figure out everything I did know so that I could see where the gaps were. Okay. And half the time I knew their career better than they did. They would go, oh yeah, that's right. I did do that. I did say that you know. <laughs> but every now and then you would get a story that you possibly couldn't have known, you know, this behind the scenes stuff. And, you know, one of the best ones I heard was from a rapper. His name was Peter Guns. And he was a guy from the Bronx who was popular in the 90s. And he said he was in Vegas one time for a concert. And he's in the lobby. And these two rappers come up to him and say, hey, we're rapping. You know, we would like to work with you and this and that. And he kind of said, yeah, you need to talk to my agent. Kind of brushed him off. Well, he said about 10 minutes later, Mike Tyson walked up behind him and poked him on the shoulder. And he said, hey, these are artists on my record company. Don't be a jerk. And I was like, well, what did you do? He said, I never met Mike Tyson before. He said, what did you think I did? We went to the studio. <laughs> you don't say no to Mike Tyson, especially back then. <laughs> During research and writing, did anything you came across really surprise you? Yeah, the, the, the one thing that surprised me the most was how many of these guys knew each other before they were famous. A lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of the big boxing gyms are in the Bronx or in sort of tough parts of big cities. Well, I mean, for the first 20 years of hip hop, all of those rap icons are coming out of those same streets. So it would be interesting when I would interview someone and say, oh, you have a Zab Judah reference in your music. And they would say, I grew up with Zab. He was three doors down, you know, in the project. They knew each other. They, I mean, that was one of the reasons this cultural connection is also socioeconomic. It is geographical, it's spatial. And in hip hop, rappers represent their block, their borough, their neighborhood. 
boxing works that way too. We see a lot of Mexican fighters come to the ring with mariachi music. Or you'll see, you know, uh, the British fighters come to, you know, come out the, you know, British punk rock or whatever. So there's like this performance of identity that happens in hip hop that also happens in rap. But the thing I didn't expect was that these guys knew each other, that they were friends before, you know, either group of folks wow. were, were famous. That was so much fun to, re, you know, to hear about. I was like shocked by that. It was not something I expected. Okay. Todd, can we talk a little bit about your writing process? We talked about how you gathered the information. How do you sit down and get it on paper? Yeah, this was a tough turnaround because, you know, as Rachel alluded to, Bundini came out in 2020. And this book came out in November 2021. So uh, it was a grind. The minute I sent Bundini off to the publisher to have it edited and sent to the printer, I was already doing research for B-boxing. That was already in the works. I already had chapters drafted before Bundini was even finished. Uh, in some ways, it feels like a sequel to Bundini. Okay. Because with Ali and Bundini, it's everything that happens pre-hip-hop. This book is everything post-Ali, starting in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, so I was in the right mindset after researching Ali and Bundini to sort of understand the cultural connections. Uh, but the writing was tough. It was six days a week, six hours a day, five hours a day. Uh, once again, the pandemic helped me a little bit in the sense that I was home for a lot of that. There was nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So I had no excuse other than, you know, taking care of my little guy, my son. I, I was, you know, my butt in the chair working every day. Uh, I used to write in coffee shops all the time. And I liked being out in public. And that was another hard thing. I had to write at home. I had to learn how to do that. But, you know, if you're a real writer, you adapt, I suppose. So, yeah, it was tough work. And I was working on this and doing research and writing all the way up to the time we sent to the typesetter. I, I was hustling right to the end because I wanted to keep it current and things kept happening in the boxing world that I wanted to include in the book. So we were working right up to the deadline, right? Right up to the point where it's time to turn it in. <laughs> Did you listen to the music while you were writing or editing? Uh, no, I can't listen to rap music when I write. I love rap music, but if I listen to rap music, I'll be listening to rap music. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, I listen to jazz, like piano jazz, like a All Ma right. Jamal that kind of thing. Uh, Coltrane, that kind of stuff is what I listen to when I write because it, it just gets me in the right vibe, the right mood. Right. But if I listen to Tupac, I'll be grooving. I'll be listening to Tupac. To Tupac. I, won't, I won't pay attention to what I'm doing. The only time that I was listening to the music was during the research when I was trying to put together that database of songs that reference uh, boxing. Great. Uh, Todd, each year the, you're the organizing force behind Hip Hop Week at Siena College. Can you talk a little bit about that event and what you hope people who attend take away from it? Yeah, we're, I'm really proud to say this. We're coming into our ninth year of wow. Siena Hip Hop Week, and we've had icons of rap culture come to Siena, have dinner with my students, and give a lecture that's free to the public. So we've had Grandmaster Flash, who is one of the folks who invented hip hop as we know it. We've had Shy Rock, who was the first female rapper. We had Biz Marquis, rest his soul, who passed away. We had, uh, you know, Kareem Burke, who's Jay-Z's business manager. We had Master Killer from the Wu-Tang. We've had so many icons, Chuck D from Public Enemy, all these like iconic rap people who have, have came to Siena and been a part of the event. My goal is never to pick an artist that the students will be excited to see. My goal is to pick an artist who is a, a huge reason that hip hop is still around, an icon, a pioneer who they can learn from. So it's an educational experience. They give a talk to the students. Uh, the students are able to interact and ask questions. When I have my speaker lined up, I always kind of cater the course to the guest speaker so that they're familiar with the catalog and the work so that they can ask educated questions. But I, I'm very proud that this thing is, is kept going and we're still, we're still going strong. And, uh, you know, the pandemic slowed us down as far as in-person stuff. But, you know, we were able to do the virtual event last year with Biggs. Yep. And, you know, I, I think it was still a success and a, and a once in a lifetime experience for the students. So once again, the, my love of hip hop is personal and professional. It's also what I teach at Siena. Right. Todd, thank you so much. I'd like to open it up to our audience. Do we have any questions? Yes, we actually just got our first audience question from Sean. 
um, saying, another great piece of work, Todd. Can you explain the process of compiling Appendix A? It's amazing, a great reference for all. Yeah, thank you, Sean. I really appreciate you always supporting my work. Thank you, brother. Um, I, I wish I could tell you that, oh, this was really hard, painstaking work. But I'm a hip hop nerd, Sean. I love this. And I knew I wanted to begin my research process by proving to readers that there is no genre in the world that covers boxing like hip hop. So I had to, had to acquiesce a little bit and concede to the fact that boxing inspires a lot of artists and poets and filmmakers. There's a lot of boxing songs in other genres of music, but I wanted to prove that this is, I mean, as far as hip hop goes, there's nothing like it. They, they reference managers, obscure fighters, ring announcers, promoters, uh, sometimes hip hop even reinvents boxing history. And there's a song by the Wu-Tang Clan called the MGM, which is a reference to the MGM Grand. And it takes place, the song takes place at a fictional rematch between Julio Cesar Chavez and Pernell Sweet P. Whitaker. In the real fight, there was a draw and neither guy won the fight. It's controversial. So the, the song takes place at the rematch, which never took place. And the guys are rapping from ringside seats describing the action of the fight. So hip hop is deep in its boxing knowledge. So what I did was I put together as many songs as I could come up with. And I had my database up to a thousand songs, Sean. And the publisher was basically like, I don't think we can fit a thousand songs in the back of the book. So we cut it to 500 and I qualified it. I tried not to use any song where a rapper was paid to write about boxing, like on a soundtrack to like When We Were Kings or something like that or a song where a rapper uh, is rapping with a boxer. Like Roy Jones Jr. also rapped, you know, some of the Floyd Mayweather had a rap song, Tyson dabbled in rap. So I just wanted to show that if you pick up any rap record, you're probably gonna get some references to boxing. So I wish I could say that was hard to put together, but it was pretty fun, it was easy. And I was teaching my hip hop class at the time. So I was always testing things out on my students trying to get them to comb uh, the internet for references I missed. And every now and then, one of my students would come up with something I hadn't missed, especially with the newer stuff. But it was a lot of work. It, it definitely took me about four or five weeks to get the initial draft of that put together because I just kept hearing other songs and I would catch references. And I talked to a lot of the rappers I interviewed, Sean, about why they do that. Like, why do you reference boxing so much in your music? And I'll never forget, one of the rappers said to me, it's an Easter egg for guys like you. I put it in there because I know guys like you are going to get it and like it because I love it like you love it. I know my fans. I know what they like. So I like to think of it as an Easter egg. And I, I, I gathered all my Easter eggs for other fans like us who love both. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask to myself if that's OK. Um, you mm -hmm. referenced earlier Muhammad Ali as being really sort of foundational to hip hop. And I wondered, is there something in the rhythm of boxing, the way that when boxing is going really well, it's very rhythmical, that is sort of part of that, that root of yeah. hip hop, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, Lisa was asking me things that surprised me. Well, one of the things that surprised me was I didn't really think about the ways in which hip hop is a rhythm aid for boxing trainers. And I knew this as a, as a kid who boxed my dad, you know, I also trained fighters with my father. Like we played it in the gym that rhythm is the most important thing in boxing. You can't fight like a robot. You have to have rhythm and movement and your, your movements have to be fluid. If you watch Ali, he would skate around the ring and look like he was on ice skates. So a lot of the trainers who I talked to, some in the book and some sort of off the record, say hey I just put it on for the music loosen up for shadow boxing and getting rhythm I don't care for the lyrics I don't care for the curse words but they do it for the rhythm so you know a lot of the fighters I talked to said hey I couldn't train without music I couldn't train without this and there are actually a lot of research studies out there that suggest you can work out longer and harder with certain types of music and they break it down to the beats per minute and everything we think of what hip-hop was originally intended for Rachel was block parties for break dancers. They called them b-boys because they danced to break beats. So everything about early hip hop is about that movement, that fluidity. It, it wasn't like to teach you life lessons in the early days. It was about dance music. It was about, you know, rhythm and, and you know, kinetic energy. 
So it's, you know, that's a connection that I knew, but maybe hadn't fully articulated in my mind till I started interviewing boxing trainers and who were like, yeah, I, I, I never open the gym without rap music playing. I have it on before the guys even show up because I want them to do everything with rhythm, even tying their boxing shoes. I want everything ryth rhythmic uh, because that's how you keep, keep yourself upright in the boxing game. You have to be slick. I've got a question for you, Todd. It's now in, if I'm remembering correctly, LL Cool J's mama gonna knock you out. Is that just metaphor or is there boxing in that too? Oh, he, there's references to Ali in that song. And really that music video was almost more iconic than the song itself. They shot it like the uh, Raging Bull movie, you know, with uh, Robert De Niro, black and white, LL Cool J's rapping from inside a boxing ring. And I mean, back when I was an amateur fighter, everybody came to the ring. The mama said, knock you out. That was like the entry song that everyone was playing. Uh, it's so iconic that I think, um, I think Everlast just put out a, a collection of like hip hop clothing with like lyrics from the song on the back of the shirts and the jackets. That song still today is popular among my students. They know that song. They see it as a boxing song. Um, the reason LL Cool J wrote that song was that he had put out an album that kind of flopped. His sophomore album wasn't very successful. And there were a lot of rappers dissing him and putting him down because he had, people thought he was a one hit wonder. So he came out with Mama Said Knock You Out. It's like uh, a rebuttal to all of his critics. And of course, Elo Cool J has boxing roots in his family. His uh, grandfather was the first black light heavyweight champion ever in, in the US. So like there was boxing in his family. So when he wrote that song, he had boxing in mind. When they made the video to that song, they used boxing as a visual motif. Certainly one of the most important uh, boxing hip hop songs of all time, for sure. Absolutely. I've got another question, unrelated, but I, when, when we hosted you for Bundini, if I recall, you know, he and, and Ali both had these kind of um, early hip hop kind of rhymes that they would throw, right? Yeah, there's a lot going on there. You got to think like some of that's the dozens, the culture of sort of dissing people in the street, that sort of language being a part of your personality and bravado. Bundini got that from the streets of Harlem. Uh, and also the other part of that was there was a spoken word culture at the time. I think Gil Scott Heron, that's the era. A lot of these other sort of the, the, the last poets, a lot of these other black spoken word poetry movements that were influential to Ali as well, that he was kind of borrowing from their template in, in doing his pre-fight routines. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of stuff happening in black culture that they're borrowing from. But when they do it, uh, you know, every kid in America is doing it, white or black. And it becomes like a cool thing to do because Ali could back it up. And it was Big Daddy Kane who I interviewed who said to me, uh, I molded my rhyme style after Ali and Bundini, not any other rappers. I wanted to be the Muhammad Ali or Bundini Brown of rap music. So I was gonna diss other rappers. I was gonna brag about how great I was and how no one could compete with me. I just wanted to take that Ali feeling and put it on wax, to put it on my records. So yeah, I agree. They were very important to, the, to how rap sounded, especially in the early days. We've got another great question from Sean um, saying, do you feel the desire of our generation's great boxers to be great rappers hurt the boxing careers? Boxers like Roy Jones or Adrian <laughs> Broner? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, look, you can't, boxing is a full-time job. How you eat, how you sleep, how you run, how you work out, everything you do is to prepare you for something that most folks like us avoid, getting punched in the face. It is very hard to be a boxer and a rapper because the lifestyles are so different. And I think it was Master Killer from Wu-Tang who said to me, I respected those guys who are boxing and rapping, but there are levels to this. Our whole life is around pinning the best rhymes, having the best flow. I mean, they battled other rappers on the streets and ciphers. They dedicated their craft to their art in the same way a boxer dedicates his life to his work. And guys like Roy Jones and Adrian Broner and Zab Judah, they walk the tightrope. And it's very hard to do both. And a lot of people feel like, especially Roy and Adrian, their careers were maybe cut short or compromised 
by trying to exist in both worlds. Uh, it's very possible, yeah. And I, th I think especially with Adrian Broner, you've got a guy who grew up wanting to be a rapper first, didn't know how to make that a reality, so he went with boxing. So, you know, some of these guys wanted to be rappers and boxing was all that they could do. And then once they had the opportunity, they went back to, to follow their first love. I think that's the case with Roy Jones, too. His dad wouldn't let him play rap music in the gym. So when he fired his dad and got a new trainer, he starts making his own rap music to walk to the ring to. So I think Roy's first love probably was Dirty South Hip Hop. Uh, but, yeah, I do think it costs. I, I do think it costs both those guys a couple losses for sure. And it looks like he has a follow-up. He said, what's next? Um, I can't say too much about this, but there is interest in making beatboxing a documentary. So, you know, we're trying to make that happen. And uh, I think in some ways, I'm really proud of the book, but I think it could be an even better documentary. You can see the music and the videos that would give you another layer of understanding of what I'm writing about. Uh, so, you know, Fingers crossed that might be a reality for this year. Hopefully everything will line up the way it's supposed to and we'll be able to do a documentary on beatboxing. So that's the goal. Uh, we will see. Todd, I so wanted to- I'm a, Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, I wanted to get in a question, a great segue with documentary. Have you ever thought about writing a screenplay? Uh, yeah, I think every writer's thought about that a time or two. Uh, in putting together the documentary, I did. I, I have had a little bit of screenwriting experience in putting the, trying to turn the book into a, you know, mm. a, a format that would better translate to the documentary. If it does happen, uh, the format will look a lot different because you know a book you can get away with some things that you can't in a film. Uh, so yeah, it's something I'm learning. I'm learning on the job, so to speak. Uh, that, yeah, that would be something I love to do. Uh, who knows? Who knows? I've had two books in two years, so like. I'm going to take a little break as far as the, the, the writing goes, but we'll see where it takes me. And something I would love to do, absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Todd. I'm afraid we're just about out of time, but I did get a direct message to another question, which was, um, didn't, uh, didn't Fresh the Fresh Prince write a song about uh, Mike Tyson? <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote about this in the book. That's a great question. Uh, the first tape I ever bought in my life, first cassette tape was the Fresh Prince's I Think I Can Beat Mike Tyson. And it was a song where he, you know, if you knew Will Smith back in the day, he was a skinny dude, not a tough looking guy. And he had a song like, I think I can beat Mike Tyson. And in the video, Don King's in the video, Mike Tyson. And it's sort of comical. Tyson beats him. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny song. But it was the very first tape I ever bought. I was in the second grade. And the reason I loved it was I loved the Fresh Prince. I loved Will Smith. But also my dad, his favorite fighter was Mike Tyson. It married the two things that we liked. And it's not ironic to me at all that years later, Will Smith plays Muhammad Ali in Michael Mann's movie. There's a biopic called Ali. So it's ironic that, you know, he started out being, you know, this sort of goofy comedic rapper who joked about fighting Mike Tyson. Years later, he plays Muhammad Ali in the first movie about Ali's life or, you know, First movie Ali wasn't involved in, I should say. Yeah, important song though, definitely an important song. Fantastic. Thank you, Todd and Lisa, so much for doing this this evening. It's been a really fascinating conversation and I've loved listening. Um, audience, thank you all for being here. You can order beatboxing at northshire.com and check out our other schedule of other great upcoming events. I want to thank Northshire and everyone who tuned in. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone's time. Hope to see you in person next time. Thank you, Hopefully. Northshire. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a great night, everybody. Take care, Good night. Thanks, Todd and Lisa. Thank you.